Let me tell you a story. It's no ordinary tale. No, it's the ordinary, from which every other story hails. It's the story of God. It's the story of history, and I'm not the author, no. The author is a glorious mystery. See, long before he would put his pen to the paper, long before there was time, or before there was matter, he was there all alone. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, everlasting in existence, completely satisfied, needing absolutely nothing. He was happy in himself and his joy was overflowing. The Son in the arms of his holy, righteous Father, the Spirit overshadowing, all glorifying one another. So why would this God even bother to create the fountain of all happiness? Can you improve upon this state? Well, the joy within himself welling up at such capacity was so full it must be shared with a glorious society. So the mighty author, quill in hand, to share his infinite mind, his love, his joy, sat down to write his once upon a time. <clears throat> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made all things to reflect his beauty and his worth. Mountains, rivers, oceans, trees, all gladly testifying. Endless stars and galaxies declare his glory shining. He made it all and it was good. And to culminate his work, he fashioned man and breathed to life his special ball of dirt. Man came to life with blinking eyes and was welcomed by God's face. They walked with him every day and night. There was peace and no such thing as shame. God said, be fruitful, fill the earth, and eat from any tree, except for this one, because if you do, you'll surely fall from me. Now why do this and give this choice? Because he is writing a story, and he's about to show the whole world the fullness of his glory. Conflict enters early on in the script with a snake in the garden doing what he does best, running his lip. Flashback to when this evil was created. He was an angel of heaven who fell when his head got inflated. Banished from God and from his endless mercy, he came down to earth to tempt us with the unworthy. So there in the garden on an ordinary day, he came to the woman and said, did God really say that you should not eat from every tree in the garden? He must not want your happiness or you'd have total freedom. So pridefully they listened, sinfully they took, and scorned their creator as they ate forbidden fruit. Injustice, my friends, this is injustice. That God should be seen and then treated as a nothing. That man should completely forfeit his joy and dig for fleeting pleasures in the gutters of this world. Fallen now is all mankind and sure to face his judgment. A world of pain, of toil and strain and hell forever after. But God would make a promise to preserve himself a people. And through the brokenness of Mano, could there shine a hero? The plot line continues, some character development, all supporting actors, all fantastic as embellishment. Noah found favor in God's holy sight, and when God sent the floods, he mercifully preserved his life. We come to Abraham, and God made him a covenant. He said, I will bless you, make your offspring abundant. To Isaac and to Jacob, God would come and do the same, and though many dangers came to threaten his perfect plan, the story would go on with the author's full control, and he would lead his people everywhere that they should go. Flash forward now, 400 years, in Egypt there's a Pharaoh who doesn't like God's people growing numerous in freedom. He made them slaves, but God came down and chose his servant Moses, a burning bush, a call to go. His presence was his promise. Moses, tell that Pharaoh now to let my people go so they can freely worship me in the place that I will show. Plagues numerous, God will prove that he is the I am, that Pharaoh's rule is like a pawn in his glorious hand. The waters part, the millions leave to follow their great savior. He guided them, provided for them, though they were so ungrateful. At Sinai, God gave the law so perfect and so pure. His people soon discovered, though, they could not obey these rules. They tried, they failed, they tried, they failed, compelled to live in sin. They'd bow to worship idols and they'd bow to God again. They said to God, give us a king and that will make things better. God, their rightful king, assured them this would be a fetter. They insisted, God relented, gave to them their kings. Some were good, led them to him, some brought idolatry. Then came the prophets, turn back to God. Sometimes the people listened, but mostly they just gave a nod because they all wanted to be him. God will not wink at your sin, the prophets would all say. The people rose to eat and drink, they left to go and play. God finally seemed to have enough and brought a blaring quiet. The prophets ceased, the people waited 400 years of silence. Enter our protagonist, mostly unannounced. The plot is quickly rising now. 
Who is this guy? Nobody really knows. He's meek, he's humble, an ordinary hero. But the craziest thing about this character is, well, unlike the other characters, this is the author himself. His name was Jesus. He was born of a virgin. Fully God, he was perfect. Fully man, he was learning. Different from all the others, but tempted just the same in every single way we are, yet without a single sin. He made the lame to jump and he caused the blind to see. And unlike the religious leaders, he had some real authority because he came from on high and he came to redeem, not to be served, but to serve his haters and enemies. He loved, he gave, showed us the heart of the author, claimed no glory for himself because he came from his father and we hated him for it because we wanted to be God. Despised and rejected, we esteemed him not. Conflict escalating now, it starts with a betrayal. Judas whores his eternal Lord for 30 pieces of silver. A final meal of prayer and then they head into the garden where Jesus sweat with drops of blood preparing for our pardon. The soldiers took the Lord away and led him to a trial. Are you the son of God? They say I am, there's no denying. Except of course for his disciples who left their Lord in fear. Jesus looked up to the sky, he was all alone from here. They led him to the praetorium and then they began to beat him. Who hit you? They would shout and say, oh father, please forgive him. They made his back a bloody mess. They whipped him till he lost his breath. They threw the cross upon his wounds, the weight of sin, 300 pounds. The great eternal Lord of all, the author of all things, now like a lamb to the slaughter. Would this be his defeat? They nailed him to the rugged cross. They shouted out, where is your God? He said, have you forsaken me? He takes a breath, his final three. It is finished. The Savior's cry, and then he bowed his head. The author of life, the Lord of all, the Son of God, is dead. They laid his body in a tomb. Then everything was quiet, as God's people find themselves again in everlasting silence. Two days pass. On the second morning after Jesus died, Mary went to the tomb to take a look inside. And when she arrived, she was met by an angel. She fell to the ground, but he said, there's no danger. This Jesus, Jesus, is he the one you seek? Mary, he is not here. He is risen indeed. Climax is true. Every good story has one. That part where you feel a slight shift of momentum. Mary sprints to go tell the other disciples, the Lord, he's alive. He's alive like he promised. Peter and John go to see for themselves, but there's nothing there. Perhaps he truly lives. Then Jesus' words came flashing to mind. They will kill the Son of Man, but after three days, he will rise. Momentum is surely building now. The enemy is limping. Jesus finds the 12, and then he gives to them the mission. All authority is mine, all in heaven and on earth. Go and tell them I'm alive. Go and tell the whole wide world, and don't get slack. I'm coming back. Acts now, the church is born, the Holy Spirit given. The news of Jesus, like the most contagious sickness spreading. Thousands saved, a mighty wind is blowing through the region. The promise God gave to Abraham, we're finally starting to see it. Repentance and forgiveness preached all in the name of Jesus. Sinners and saints alike proclaim our God has come to save us. The Gentiles hear the story and the news is blowing up. The plan is working, gospel spreading from Asia to Africa. Martyrs laying down their lives because they know this story is true. It's a story like no other. It's a movement you cannot undo. Constantine tried to slow it down and turn it into steeples, but an angry monk from Germany wrote some holy gospel thesis. It spread like fire and then it came to America by sale and here we are the 21st century because the gospel cannot fail it's the greatest story that's ever been told by the greatest author the world has ever known but there is some still left to go yes there is some still left to go see go was the command to every tribe and nation to carry this great story to this dying generation because when this gospel finally spreads across the whole of earth we're going to hear a trumpet sound and Jesus will return heaven will be opened and a white horse shall appear and the one who sits upon it all his enemies shall fear his eyes will be like fire and his purpose will be glory justice for all evil life for all who love this story He'll come to judge the quick, the dead, and all who trod this world. Every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Death and Hades he will throw into the lake of fire, and Satan too, that serpent foe, that coward, that old liar. The church will rise, surround the throne, and clothed in glory his. With every tribe and tongue, we will worship him, singing, worthy, worthy is the lamb, the lamb who has been slain. Blessing and honor, glory and power forever to his name, and for ages and ages we will sing the praises of our God and King. It's the greatest story that's ever been told.
told by the greatest author the world has ever known. Yeah, the bad guys lose, the good guys win. Jesus is Lord of all the end.